Welcome to our Bible study. Uh, we are in week number 14 of our study of Romans. We're uh, only up to Romans chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 9 through 12 this week. Um, but again, as always, if this is your first time with us, welcome. We're happy to have you. Um, but we're studying this book verse by verse. We're zoomed in pretty close. Uh, when you do that, you run the risk of, of missing out the bigger picture. So uh, if, if you're with us for the first time, watch this, hang out, but then go back and start at the beginning. There's a playlist here on YouTube uh, where you can watch all these studies all the way through. Uh, and I hope you do, though, um, because you'll, you'll get a lot more out of it. Um, so with that being said... Um, Let's jump back into the train of thought. Let's jump back into the train of thought of, of where we're at in the book of Romans. See, last week, um, Paul talked about Abraham, right? He, he, we're, we're in this section where, where Paul is, is kind of trying to explain the big deal about faith, Right, so up to this point, he's been talking about rebellion, about how humans uh, were were lost, were helpless on the day of judgment. You know, when we're when God finally decides where we're going to go, whether we're part of His people or not. Essentially, um, that there is going to be a trial, and you will either be justified, where God looks at you and says, "You are made righteous, you are right." right? Or not. And that without Jesus, we have no hope of that. And so he's been making this big argument all the way up to this point about how Jesus is the only way that any of us are made right. Faith in Jesus. And faith being more than just belief, but but action and all the things that go into loyalty and obedience and, and all of that. And so last week he talked about how Abraham is the father of this this faith in a sense uh, we looked at how you know the, that we're all adopted into this new family right that when you become part of a covenant that a covenant makes you family that's the that's the status of people after they become part of a covenant you know a wedding is a covenant you know that that, that you are now family even though you aren't related biologically uh, you are now family you, you're trusting each other treating each other as a family and so God makes this covenant with humanity and he started it with Abraham and Abraham if you're unfamiliar was the father of the people of Israel uh, he is he's he, God made a promise to him that hey I'm gonna give you so many descendants so many people are gonna call you father there's more than there are stars in the sky or grains of sand in the desert like that's how many how, how many offspring I'm gonna give you and Again, Genesis tells the story of this, um, but essentially that, that's, that's what happens. But we looked last week about how uh, God made this promise to Abraham. They made this covenant that, that God agreed to take the punishment if Abraham's descendants don't keep up with it, which is exactly what happened through Jesus. Um, but the big thing was that Abraham was, was, was considered part of this covenant, faithful to this covenant, obedient to this covenant, participating in this covenant, there's a million different verbs you could use for it, that he was part of God's covenant, this new family, uh, on the basis of faith, that Abraham predated uh, the Mosaic law, the Jewish law, that, that the, the Jews of Paul's day were pushing that, 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 that you need to keep these laws because these are the things that, that define us as God's people. We keep the law. We keep it the right way. We're the only ones, right? This, this bragging, boasting thing we talked about a few weeks ago. And so ultimately what Paul is saying is, hey, you all look at Abraham, you say, hey, he's the father of our people, right? The covenant people. What was his membership based on? It was based on faith alone. That's why Paul says in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 4, he says, what shall we say then? Have we found Abraham to be our ancestor in a human fleshly sense? After all, if Abraham was reckoned in the right, right, just justified, there's that word, on the basis of works, he has grounds to boast, but not in God's presence, and so he's pointing out that, hey, like all of you who are, who are saying you need to become like the Jewish people, keep the Mosaic law, the law that was given to Moses, that way you can be part of Abraham's family. Well, you're, like, you're saying, well, basically you're disqualifying Abraham because Abraham never kept the law. There was no temple. There were no, none of that. Now there were things that he did, right? Um, but that's a study for another day. And so we, we see that he makes this argument. This is the, the, who God is. This is his quality. This is his character because this is what he's really looking for for those who are going to be part of his covenant, the covenant that Jesus brought. Uh, and so we finished last week with verses 6 through 8. And, and this is where Paul quotes a psalm of David where he talks about uh, what it, how blessed it is to be people who who have God's forgiveness. Let me, let me just read verses 6 through 8. It says, We see the same thing when David speaks of the blessing that comes from, to someone whom God calculates to be in the right, justified, now word again, apart from works. 
Blessed are those whose law breaking is forgiven and whose sins have been covered over. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not calculate sin. And so, so Paul quotes this, and then he launches into today's section, starting in um, verse 9. He says, So then, does this blessing, the one that David was talking about, come on circumcised people or on uncircumcised? This is the passage he quoted. His faith was calculated to Abraham as indicating that he was in the right. How was it calculated? When he was circumcised or when he was uncircumcised? It wasn't when he was circumcised. It was when he was uncircumcised. He received circumcision as a sign and a seal of the status of covenant membership on the basis of faith which he had when he was still uncircumcised. This was so that he could be the father of all who believe, when, even when uncircumcised, so that the status of covenant membership can be calculated to their account as well. He is also, of course, the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who follow the steps of faith which Abraham possessed while still uncircumcised. So, this is kind of an awkward section to talk about. Um, he talks about circumcision a lot, which, uh, you know, I, if little kids are watching, I'm going to allude to things, but I'm, I'm trying not to, I try to keep this PG as best I can. Um, but the Bible is not PG. It is very much X rated. Um, and so uh, basically, if you study the, the, the story of Abraham, right? We have this moment happen where God makes this covenant with him, right? He quotes this section again, uh, where uh, he says his faith was calculated to Abraham as righteousness, right? He he quotes this section again from Genesis. And Paul makes the point here to say, hey, uh, it was counted to him before he was circumcised, because we see a couple chapters later in Genesis that that's when circumcision happened. Uh, If you're unfamiliar with what circumcision has to do with the law and and the Jews, uh, essentially it was the physical sign on men, not women, just on men, that, uh, that that they were a part of God's people. It was a physical sign. I don't know whether they were checking and stuff. Like, that's kind of not the point. The point is it was a sacrifice for the men who did it, especially if they did it as adults. Um, but it was, a, it was a physical sign that showed they were part of God's people, that they were part of the covenant. It was the determining factor. If you were not circumcised as a man, you could not be part of God's people, according to the Jews of Paul's day. And for most of Jewish history, after Moses, even after the time of Abraham, it started with Abraham and his sons. That was where this practice began. This is where God first told the people of Israel to do it as a sign. This came from God. This wasn't a man-made thing. But again, Paul's point here is that Abraham was already part of the covenant, already considered righteous before this sign. And, you know, this is kind of a thing, it's a temptation that that people just naturally fall into, that we want to see obvious signs that people are part of our team, right? I mean, if if you look at it from a a kind of a silly perspective, a a little kids and and teenagers, right? Every generation has fads, right? Like, growing up, I I had a bowl cut. That wasn't a fad. Bowl cuts are cool. Always have been. Always will be. Um, But I remember as a kid that everybody started getting Nike swooshes shaved into the side of their head, right? The, the Nike logo, right? Like, it, you know, as a six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10-year-old, I don't really remember how old I was. I desperately wanted one. And I remember fighting with my parents about wanting a Nike swoosh shaved into the side of my head or the back of my head. Uh, looking back now, it's like, that is just dumb. Like, there's no two ways about it. That is a dumb thing to do. But everybody around me was doing it. All the boys were doing it. It was the cool thing to do. All my friends had it. All the cool kids at school had it. Like, I wanted to be part of that team. I wanted to be part of the tribe. I wanted to fit in. So I needed the Nike swoosh shaped into the side of my head. You know, and every generation has that, you know. Again, I'm a kid of the 90s, so... We had some doozies, you know. We had the Jinko jeans, the ones that were super huge. Like, they, they basically used four pairs of jeans worth of denim to make each one. They were massive. Um, you know, we, we had all kinds of things. And then, you go know, the 80s, you had the parachute pants and the hair teased up to the sky, you know. You had all that. The 70s, you had the bell bottoms and uh, the, the big shades and the disco suits. I mean, it just every generation, the 50s had the... The the, 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 the the Elvis stuff you had the, in the 40s, you had the, the swing stuff in the 30s, you had the, the, the stringy stuff. Like you just every generation has these fads where people look at things that everybody else is doing like, I need to be.
be a part of that. I want to fit in. It's a temptation we all face, that, that we want to be part of a group. And so the people of Israel, they had this sign that was given to them by God. The thing about these fads and these signs, they don't actually make you part of that group, right? Like, because I got the Nike swoosh shaved on the side of my head, it didn't make me one of the cool kids. I was, I think. I don't know. What is a cool kid, right? But it didn't make me that because I had that. That was a sign that represented that I was part of the group, right? You know, when, when, when you go and you join different groups, whether it's, you, know, you look at motorcycle clubs, they have their vests and their jackets and their, their patches, like, that's the sign that shows they're part of the group. F- ask one of those guys if they see somebody who's not part of the group wearing a patch, a vest, if they're part of the group, they're going to have a very strong feeling about that. Just because you have the sign that you're part of the group doesn't mean you're actually part of the group. That's Paul's point here. He said, just because you're circumcised, that's not the thing that determines whether or not you're part of the people of God. Just because you keep the law, just because you keep the rules, that's not what determines you being part of the people of God. It's tempting tempting to think that just because you do that, just because you check those boxes that you think you need to check, uh, that show the world that you're part of the group, uh, that's, that's, that's temptation. That's not actually being part of the group. Paul's whole point is that if you want to be part of the people of God, you have to have the faith. That's what made Abraham right. That's what made Abraham part of the people of God. That's what makes us part of the people of God. Not not circumcision if you're trying to go down the Jewish rabbit hole. And in today's case, it's it's not the things that you would think a Christian is supposed to do. It's not church attendance. It's not giving money to church or other charities. It's not reading your Bible. It's not praying. It's not doing all these things that Christians do. It's the faith. It's, it's actually being loyal, it's being obedient, it's doing what Christ taught, it's maturing in your faith, it's serving, it's loving others, it's following the law of agape love, it's, it's doing what Jesus taught, it's trusting in him, it's aiming for the bullseyes, the standards that God sets for your life, knowing you'll miss, knowing that grace will cover, but still trying your hardest to live as if you could hit those targets. That's the faith that matters. It's, it's not about looking like whatever picture of a Christian is in your head, whether it's, you know, it, it really, it doesn't matter. You could go down any branch of the Christian tree. Each branch has an image they hold up and say, this is what a Christian looks like. This is what a Christian does. And there's some validity in that, and that this may be what a Christian looks like. It may be what a Christian does, but that's not what makes you a Christian. It's the faith. It's the loyalty, it's the obedience, it's what happens in your heart. And so Paul's whole point here is he, he, makes, it, he makes it clear that, that it's not about the signs. Yes, there will be signs, right? There, there will be signs, right? It's, it's the whole cliche. You know, if I won the lottery, I won't tell anybody, but there will be signs. Like, if you have faith in Jesus, you may not need to tell anybody, but there will be signs. But the signs don't make you part of the people of God. And, you know, and just, just to wrap up uh, today's study, we, we see that, that Paul makes two very clear distinctions here that are going to come into uh, play as we discuss uh, how Israel fits into this whole situation now. He says that, that first in verse 11, that Gentiles don't need to consider themselves part of ethnic Israel to be part of the people of God. Right, so that, that he's, he's very clear uh, about. He says this was so that, um, let me see. Uh, I want to make sure I read this right. Um, This was so that he could be the father of all who believe, even when uncircumcised, so that the status of covenant membership could be calculated to their account as well. So basically, verse 11 tells us that, hey, if you're uncircumcised, you can be part of the people of God. Circumcision was the sign of ethnic Israel, like we discussed earlier. You don't have to be part of ethnic Israel. You don't have to consider yourself an Israelite to be part of the people of God. Okay, that's that's a big distinction. Again, the the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15 kind of made that clear to begin with. But again, all these years later, Paul is still, you know, making sure this is crystal clear because there's always confusion, right? People like to say, no, Jesus, he's the Israelite Messiah. You got to become an Israelite. No, no, you don't. Abraham wasn't, right? Um, But then in verse 12... He says this line. He says, Abraham is also, of course, the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who follow the steps of the faith which Abraham possessed while still uncircumcised. 
And so what he's saying here is, and we're going to expand on this a lot in the next few chapters, especially when we get to 9 and 10, uh, is that Israel still has a special status, but it's not based on the fact that they're Israel, if that makes any kind of sense. Again, we're going to dig into this deeper, but basically he's saying like, yes, Israel still is the people of God. Ethnic Israel can still be ethnic Israel. You can still uh, do these things. But it's all on the basis of faith, right? And again, we're going to dig into this, but I want you to kind of have that in your brain because it comes up. This is where he first starts to discuss that Israel is special, but they're nothing without Jesus. That they are not, they don't get any special privileges because they're descendants of Abraham, because of anything ethnic or, or, or law-keeping wise. That's, that's done. But they, they are still a special people because of what God did with them and through them. And so, but it's all based on faith. Like it's meaningless without faith in Jesus. Same faith that every Gentile has, they have to have too. And again, this is really an interesting study um, because it's something that people like to kind of twist and get wrong. And, and again, well, we're going to get into this. But basically, I want you to pay attention to that. That ultimately, doesn't matter whether you're an Israelite or a Gentile, your faith has to be faith in Jesus as our king and that, that God really rose him from the dead. Like you have to believe in the, what we call orthodox theology, not Eastern Orthodox. I mean like the word orthodox as it truly means on its own, that, that you have to believe in the things that the Bible teaches. Otherwise, you're something else that's not a part of the people of God. So if you have any questions, reach out. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you next time.